Hey, Dan, thanks for joining us today. Is where you're getting started. Give us a little background on yourself. Well, sure. So, uh, you know, probably not an unusual story. I spent 30 years as a practitioner before I you know, came over to the dark side of sales, as they say, right? I, um, um, you know, worked in IT, IT security, got really familiar with the product, had a lot of success with it, and uh, opportunity presented itself for me to, you know, kind of represent that product. I was like, eh, I don't really want to be a salesperson. I don't, I don't want to do that. And come to find out I was pretty good at it. Yeah. And so here I am, you know, I, I started late. I guess about 2014 is when I got into sales, but, you know, I always supported sales teams and, you know, appreciated the work they were doing, but, you know, never really had the, uh, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, courage to get out there and hear some no's, right? So. Cool. And endpoint security, what product were you selling? So uh, Big Fix, and I'm still selling it. You uh, are. Big okay. fan of the product. Um, it was originally, you know, Big Fix. It was bought by IBM. Now it's at HCL. Uh, I love the product. I love the family that's around it. It's a lot. Of, it's 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 a lot easier to sell something when you believe in it. Yeah. Did you work with Data Power at IBM at all? I did not. You I did, did not. not. Okay. No, I've I've you know <laughs> I was a one trick pony. I I came in to work on Big Fix, and then when they, you know, sold it off, I I went with it. Um, you know, I guess you could say I'm a Big Fix, uh, or we like to call it a Big Fixer, right? Big that's, fixer. Uh, cool. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a borderline cult, to be honest with you. So what was that transition like getting into sales? Well, you know, it was scary because, you know, when, when you're a practitioner, you're on the grind, you know, and I worked for a very low margin business. So you really had to, you know, you were, you know, 60 hours was an easy week, right? You, you, you just, everything was blowing up. Um, when I, the funny story was I woke up in the middle of the night and my wife's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, it's three o'clock in the morning and nobody's called me that something's blown up. I was like on 24 seven tech support mm -hmm. coverage. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I think the first time I got into that was like 1987 through 2014. So I was having so much draws, but you know, you figure that out. But the other part that was kind of interesting is, you know, like I've heard you say sales is, is, you know, getting it done. You don't have to just sit there and, and beat your head against the keyboard for eight, 10 hours a day. If you can get it done correctly, you can build those relationships. That's that's what the company wants. They don't want you sitting there slaving over a keyboard for ten hours, you know, looking at spreadsheets twenty seven ways. Well, some companies do, but <laughs> they don't want you looking at you know spreadsheets twenty seven different ways to figure out how you're going to get a nickel, you know. So well, you uh, do have to be data driven. Well, yes, yeah, and I am data driven. <laughs> it's interesting because. I was an analyst more so, and I would look like I actually went to, to, a, you know, my company at the time. And I said, listen, I've done the analysis on this particular account and we would actually be more profitable if we stopped selling them. There is bad business, right? Right, right, right. And, and you have to recognize bad business, but at the other, the other end of that is, you know, now in sales, you have to be able to look at a customer and think, okay, yeah, maybe today, you know, they're, they're going to buy a dollar and a half worth of something from me. But does that mean there's not a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, a million bucks down the road and being able to evaluate that and analyze that and look at where their current state is, where they're trying to get to, you know, doing the homework that to me has made a lot of difference. And that's what I mean by I'm data driven. I look at the companies, I look at their P&Ls, I, you know, if they're publicly traded, you know, I want to find out what's important to them and, and really get in there and, and work on providing my value. And then the pricing conversations don't, you know. Become and so and a lot of reps don't do that. They, they go with no. whatever is easiest, whoever yeah. will talk to them. Yeah. And, and what I find, and so um, it's interesting, my, my colleague that, you know, brought to you, you know, brought me to your attention, you know, one of the things I always look at is, yeah, I've got responsibilities to the business this quarter and next quarter, but I'm thinking next year, year after that, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to find ways to build value with my, my customers so that as they grow and expand, it's not a question of if they're going to use my software, it's when they're going to acquire it. And so I, I look at it as kind of building an annuity. And a lot of sellers are so focused on this quarter and you know they'd rather get $1,000 now rather than get $100 a quarter for the rest of their life. And so you know there are those times where you just go in there and you know, get what you're gonna get. Um, Funny story, my, my friend uh, um, is a touring musician. He works for a, uh, uh, a very popular uh, front man from the 80s. 
And so he took me around and he's like, Dan, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something you probably don't know about the music business. And that is, you're gonna get paid sometimes less than what you deserve. And sometimes you're gonna get paid more than you deserve. And you know what the bottom line is? Take the freaking money, <laughs> right? Get paid. And so that's the way I look at it. Sometimes you go into an account, you're like, I, I know they're beating me up. I, I know there's no reason why I need to give them this level of discount. But if I do it right and I, I provide the value going forward, okay, fine. Let's just get it off the street. Let's move on. And a lot of organizations get so caught up in what's this discount percentage and what is this and all of this you know, nonsense that you know they can't see that, yeah, okay, we're going to take a hit now, but over the next three years, this customer is going to grow and we're going to get a million dollars we would have never gotten had we stuck to our guns over, you know, seven, eight percent of a discount. I mean, yeah, that's substantial. Don't get me wrong. And that means I've got to find that seven, eight percent someplace else for this quarter or this year. But you got to have that long term strategy and you have to think it through. Is there value downstream? And if yeah. there is, take the hit and move on. <clears throat> and what was the hardest part of that transition? Because I'm sure it wasn't just all good nights so, of sleep. And <laughs> no, it was the hardest part for me too was I still struggle with a lot of the, you know, professional sellers in that I still come at it from a business analyst perspective. And I've actually helped customers solve a problem in three quarters of the way in. I knew my solution was not the one, but I did the work because I wanted to build that trust so that if I could help them later. I could, but I think that part of it too is, is, you know, where, well, you're not doing this particular thing. You're not following this particular metric. You're not doing this. When I went to, um, I, you know, the, when I was at IBM, I went to global sales school and um, the first week in, I thought I had made a terrible mistake because they were, you know, there's this process and there's this, and there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of structure and I appreciate structure. And so I went to one of the instructors, you know, and I was like, listen, I'm, I don't get it. I'm, I mean, I talk to people. I could talk to anybody. I was a front man for a rock and roll band. I mean, I have no problem talking to people, but for whatever reason, I can't figure this out. And, and I remember she said it in the nicest Southern accent. Well, honey, you got to remember all that structure is for people that don't know what they're doing. Just go have a conversation with your customer and it'll all work out. And um, so I went from worst to first. So when I finished global sales school, I was, you know, the top dog. Granted, I was older than a lot of the people I was with and, and that helped, but um, it really is, is just understanding. It's about the conversation, building the trust um, and, and use the formulas and the, the other stuff when you get stuck to reevaluate yourself. Don't lead with, you know, the, what I call, you know, the robot tone. Hi, my name is Dan, I'm going to do this. And we were going, you know, you have to have those conversations. And so, a lot of reps do have that sales voice, whether it's the robot or one of the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and you know, it was funny because I even said before I took the, I said, listen, um, I appreciate you're in sales and I've had a good relationship with you. This is the person that, that first, you know, kind of got me into this. I said, but salespeople historically would say whatever they needed to get to sale. And I'm just not about that. If I can't believe in what I'm doing, I can't be truthful, then I don't want to do it. Now, I don't mean to disparage everybody, but, you know, I don't want to be a used car salesman that's selling something else. I want to have the conversation. I want to solve the problem and then we'll figure out the money and, and, and it's worked. And that's it because in B2B, the used car salesman thing doesn't work very well no. because yeah. you've got multiple meetings and people yeah. leave and they figure it out or yeah. they, they do their own research. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, what I get in there and I, I talk to my customers, I was like, listen, I'm going to tell you up front, and I'm sure you hear this from every sales representative you talk to, I'm not your typical person in that I'm a business analyst. I really want to understand your true business problem. I've got 30 years of experience in this field. I've sat on your side of the table. Let's have the conversation. I'm going to be 100% open and honest with you when we get to the pricing discussions. I'm going to base it on my experience with this product the amount of product that you need. And I'm also going to consider your budgetary information. We're not going to do this 15 iterations just to get to a price. I'm going to start with where I think we should start. Are you okay with that? And they're, you know, 99 out of hundred times they're like, that's great. You know, there's always that one person that's got to get that extra pound of flesh and that's fine. Yeah. But when you start 
from a place of trust and understanding that I'm not here to, you know, I'm not going to get a cooler house just because of you. I'm, I'm here to be your actual partner. And, you know, a lot of people say that, but, you know, even when you think about competition, people will go up and they're like, oh, yeah, this competitor's in there. No. In our space, you never go into a green field. If we ever did, I think I probably would, would have a heart attack just from the shock. So you have to be able to get in there and know your worth, know how you can solve the problem, get it done, and, and, and get going. And when you're talking to somebody who doesn't have that 30 years experience and they say, oh, if I only had your experience, what do you yeah, tell well, them? Well, I tell them, you've got to find your own voice. I said, you know, I have 30 years of experience of how I'm telling the story and how I am and trying to connect with the customer and explain the value of what I can provide to them. Yes, part of that value is, is what I know, but, but you know, the value is in the software. So you have to be able to communicate value and solve their problem. If you're selling a product, you're going to struggle. You have to sell the value of why you and specifically you and the products you bring to the table have an understanding and are going to make their life easier. It doesn't have to be from a 30 year old, you know, 30 years of, of IT experience. It has to be with, hey, you know, I just helped my customer X and here's the problem they were facing. Is this similar to what you were doing? Use your experiences, you know. And I hear that same thing. It's like, well, if I had your account base, I said, yeah, you'd have had to start in 2014 when I started building a lot of these relationships. So, yes, I'm seeing a lot of things come to fruition now. But I mean, I've got customers that I worked with for five years before I got one ounce of revenue. But I knew if I was consistent and I kept helping them and answered their questions and, and really became a resource for them, at some point they'd give me the opportunity to show how the, the tool set can, can expand upon that. And it worked. So you, you clearly look outside the window of your comp plan. Yeah. I mean... The other part of that too is, you know, a lot of folks that get into sales early, they get addicted to the, to the, to the money crack for lack of a better thing. It has been extremely lucrative for me personally. I'll give you an example. When I, when I left IT to get into sales, I had three kids to put through college and two grand in the bank. Wow. That's a tough, that's a tough place to be. Now it's from some choices. I, you know, I decided I needed to come back, take care of some family members and made some choices. So when I now say, yeah, um, I'm living in my, you know, in, in the town that I want to live in, I bankrolled my three kids going through college. Yeah, they got some help from their jobs too, but I was able to get through all of that. Um, you know, for me personally, it, it's, it's been kind of a, a life-changing experience getting into sales and being able to articulate my message that, yeah, it took me 30 years personally, but that, you know, someone else's message they may have it figured out sooner than that. And how did you deal with the emotional roller coaster of quarter after quarter, good quarters, bad quarters? Yeah, I, I don't know that you ever can, right? Because I'm competitive. I hate to lose. And 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 I even to the point where I'll quabble over where, you know, when they're talking about who is the top rep for the year, I'll I'll get in there and say, well, yeah, but you know, we're a North American team and this particular deal came in from, you know, across the pond. So you're really going to count that for that other guy? Yeah, it's ticky tacky, but I want to win. I want to be the best at what I'm doing. And that doesn't necessarily mean the most, you know, the most income. It means that I'm respected the most by my customers. I provide the greatest value to my customers and the organization. And when I've stayed focused on that, the money seemed to follow without a whole lot of problem. And I like how you framed that, that you weren't talking that you were the best salesperson, but you did what the best things for your market and your clients, yeah. which got yeah. you the best revenue. Yeah. And I mean, I've got, you know, I went out and, and so I had some, some customers I've gone in, I've, I've created some videos where I, I call them, you know, big fix in a minute. And it's not anything. It's about the business problem. It's not about, Hey, look at these, speeds works, these are big fixes. It's, Hey, if you're buying software, and it's a shell, and then you have to develop everything inside of it. Isn't that the equivalent of buying a, a brand new office space that's an empty warehouse? Where are you going to get the resources to fill it up, right? You know, why don't you buy something that's got a fully stocked library, right? Well, that metaphor is around one of our competitors doesn't have the content library that we do so that you can hit the ground running. 
So you explain the business problem in a way that, that gets your, your speeds and feeds out there, but you're not saying, hey, look at me, I'm the shiny new toy, or I have this new feature, blah, blah, blah. Because nobody wants to hear that, yeah. you know, because everybody's <laughs> got the best software in the world. And how would you help younger reps kind of get that perspective, the client's view of well, the product, because that's what they care about. Yeah, it is. And, and so I would, and I do this now because I, I do some mentoring uh, in my current role with, with, uh, with other, other team members, some, you know, in my same age bracket, some, you know, much younger. And it really comes down to, you have to learn to have the conversation. And, and as a society, a lot of people, uh, I believe they, they hear you, but they don't listen to you. And it really focuses on you have to listen. And, and if, if you listen to what the customer says, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get a lot more. Uh, I'll give you an example. If, if the customer says to you, hey, what color is the sky on a sunny day with your software? Your answer should be blue. Is that what you were expecting? Now, nah, these folks, you know, they've been reading so many white papers and they've just, you know, this, that, and the other. They start talking about the angle of the sun and the Pantone matching system and all this other crap. And the customer's just like, yeah, I'm out. You know, it's just like I sent an email out to, to a customer and I was like, here's what I do. If you're struggling here, give me a shout. And the customer replies back, hey, I'm covered, but this is the best email I've ever received, right to the point. You didn't start with a whole lot of blathering. You just said, here's where I know you from. Here's my question. Can I help you? Let me know either way and I'll stop hitting, I'll stop spamming you for lack of a better term. And so that's what you have to do in, in pick up the phone and call somebody. Don't hide behind text messages. Don't hide behind emails. Get your face out there. You know, yeah, there's a lot of societal things with, with social media that, you know, everybody can hide, you know, behind their screen. Get out there. Don't be afraid to turn the video on when you're doing a Zoom call. If, if everyone else turns their thing off, all right, there's your, there's your cue. Nobody wants to see your mug. That's fine. Put yourself out there. And um, the first no isn't the last no. You know, in, in, in a lot of the younger folks, you know, as soon as somebody says no, they, they you know, they run and hide. It's like, ah, they're just telling you no because they want to see what you're, you know, what you're worth, what you're going to do if you're persistent. If you're going to, now there's a difference between persistence and annoyance, let's be honest. But you just have to put yourself out there. Yeah. And do you wish you got into sales earlier? I don't think I would have been as successful because I don't think I was professionally mature enough at that time. Um, I, I, used, I used to have a lot of problems with getting um, passion and you know passion confused with frustration, right? I was very passionate about, and here's what I mean by that. I would come to somebody you know, within the organization very passionate about what I wanted to do and they took it as that I was just frustrated in venting. And so you have, oh, I had to I learn how to articulate my message. And I don't think I would have been able to do that until I reached that maturity level with myself. Now, could I have gotten into it a few years earlier than I did? Yeah. 10 years? Yeah, no way. Really? Because so. that competitiveness has to have an outlet. Yeah. Or yeah. you and make so one. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm competitive with my friends, you know, we, we go, go play some golf, we go do other things, you know, whatever we do, there's, there's always a little bit of that rivalry and a little bit of crap talk and going back and forth. Um, I also, um, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, in my house, I'm kind of the dumb guy in the house. My wife's very intelligent. She's a writer. And so, who knew that when you write a book now that you need to have a, the equivalent of a trailer for your book in, in today's world, right? We all came old school where, you know, you got an agent, you got your book published. So, I, you know what I mean? And so I get into all these things out. So I'm doing trailers for her. So I'm finding other ways to be creative. And then sometimes that leads into, hey, I should probably do this for, you know, whatever's going on at, at work too. And so it's not just, you know, sell, 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 sell. It's how do I find ways to either help the team you know, I've, I've created some tools to make it easier to get quotes out to customers instead of, you know, getting out there and, you know, taking two hours to get a quote done through, through a system. You know, you've, we've all been through that. It's like, are you kidding me? Um, here's a budgetary quote. Here's the legalese so that it's just a budgetary quote. I can bang it out in five minutes. So if the customer's like, all right, cool. 
Well, I just eliminated, you know, three days of back and forth. Yeah. So, and you know, I, when yeah. you were back to being kind of on the technical side, what did you see the sales? Were you frustrated with the salespeople that you worked with? Well, you know, yeah. And, and I'll tell you why. So a lot of times, and I actually did this once and I kind of felt like a jerk afterwards, but it was kind of great on me. So I, I just said, yeah, I'm the customer. I'm going to go ahead and flex a little bit. Had a meeting, excuse me, had a meeting with a vendor and uh, there's myself and one other colleague and there's eight people from the vendor. So of course you got to go around the room where everybody can do their chest. Oh, God. You know, right, right. So I actually- I went to know, school that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And so the first guy and I'm like, okay, so let me ask you this. What value do they bring to the conversation that we're going to have today? What do you know about the product? Well, I'm, you know, that that's not my role. I said, well, in the future, you, you probably would be better suited if you did something else. Um, I appreciate meeting you and I'm glad to know who the team is. And then I went to the next guy and the next guy. And then I got to the fourth guy. I was like, oh, and by the way, it's July in Arizona. Why are you wearing a coat and tie? You're making me hot lose the tie, lose the coat. I appreciate the respect. Oh, and by the way, what value do you bring? Well, I'm the first guy's boss. Well, you two can go hang out at the coffee shop. Who's going to actually help me solve my problem? And from that point on, they would tell me, here's who's going to be here. Here's what their value is before they got there. And it worked great. We had some great conversations. I got really, you know, I was able to get in and get done what I needed to get done without all the pomp and circumstance. Nobody wants to see that. Oh, and how do you avoid that as a sales rep? So I, I ask folks if they, you know, because obviously everybody in the chain wants to come and meet the customer and do all this. I'm like, okay, <laughs> great. Check the box, yeah. I ask them, what value are you providing to the meeting? Well, you know, I have the right to be there. And actually, you don't. If you're not providing value to the customer, what, what good is it? Uh, I actually went and met with a, with a CIO and I made the appointment and I got there, went by myself and the CIO's assistant came out and said, where's the rest of your team? I said, there is no one else. It's just me. But you work for company X. They always have extra people. Yeah, I didn't invite them. I just want to have a, a conversation. Yeah, I just want to have a conversation with the CIO. So it was a 30 minute meeting that went an hour and a half. Yeah. I couldn't help the guy. I went down every possible avenue. I learned a great deal about his business. And to this day, and this has been five years, I'm still trying to figure out a way to help this guy. But I don't know that I can because of just the constraints he has, you know, from the budget and, and just the industry that he's in. But that is, is now people start to think, okay, if I'm not adding value, I've got a meeting coming up next week. And we actually had the call yesterday. I said, listen, if, no, if you're not providing value, please don't occupy the space. We need these people here, period. So it went from eight or 10 people. Now we're down to four. Perfect sense. Yeah. And what do you wish you learned earlier that you've learned in the last few years in sales? What? Well, to not take myself and, and be so hard on myself, right? Sometimes deals just don't work. And so, yeah, you have to reflect on how you managed it, how you handled it, and you have to learn from mistakes, you know, all of that stuff. But sometimes it's just, it's just a crap situation. And so to not take it personally, I, um, you know, I, I guess maybe I'm a little emotional for a salesperson, which maybe adds to my own stress level, but it's because I care about what I'm doing in my craft, but I also care about what it's doing for that customer. And so, um, I wish I had learned, you know, and in the last few years, I've learned to just take a step back, relax, you know, and also, you know, ask for help, right? You don't have to be a lone soldier out there, go and get some help, you know, and some people will say, well, that's great. Cause then if the you know, ship starts to sink, other people can bail water. But my opinion is getting the other help, it gives me a different perspective in maybe in my own, in my own cloud of where I'm operating then I didn't see something that yeah, I should have known this was going to be crap three months ago and not spend so much time on it. Yeah. So well, that's, it's called Solomon's paradox and that yeah. even, even the act of talking about it, you could talk to a tree about your deal yeah. and it would help because yeah, yeah. you're starting to think about it from a different perspective. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so, and then, 
the flip of that is, is I've gotten in, you know, there's been, been deals that were going sideways and I would be brought in even, you know, and I'll do it. It's not, it's not my responsibility. There's no compensation for me, but it's the right thing to do for the customer. Get in there and explain in, in, in maybe in better terms because of my, my past experience, Hey, this is, this is where we're coming from. And, and I've had multiple times where we've had deals go sideways that we've been working on for three months. Two weeks later, we got the PO. And so try to remember those opportunities more instead of dwelling on the ones where you didn't get it done. There's a customer that uh, to this day, um, it just grates on me that I didn't get the deal done. And uh, eventually I will. Yeah. I've just got to figure it out. And as far as that caring, because that goes with the competent competitiveness, um, but that the downside of that is if you care too much at the wrong stage of a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you can't care a ton at the prospecting stage. No. You, well, yeah, you're right. You're right. But, but you can care enough to understand their problem Yes. from a business perspective and not just assume, you know, like I had a customer come to me and, and truthfully it was going to be like, you know, a 20 or $30,000 deal. And it's like, okay, in the grand scheme of things, eh, it's probably like, you know, 15 times below what, where I want to be working on stuff, right? But I, I cared and I, I, I listened to them and I helped them get through it. Well, they got acquired. And oddly enough, the little guy on the totem pole went to the big guy and said, you have no idea what these folks have done for us. Well, well now the big company is buying our product and I've already done the POC. I've already done all the selling. I've just got to figure it out. So again, it's, it's more that annuity type of a, a situation. But the, the point about caring, people sense it. Yes. And when the other person it's, sense that you care, yeah, trust is built, openness. It's genuine. It's, it's genuine care and concern. I, I, to this day, have customers from my, my, you know, from the food service industry when I was doing IT there that um, I could walk into their restaurant today and they won't let me pay. Yeah. Because when they had a struggle, I cared, I worked with them, I went in and helped them do some food cost analysis, things that were way outside of my purview, but they were a customer, they needed help, they asked some questions. When people make that connection, they know that you care, that you're trustworthy, and you're not there to just, you know, get a cooler take. house on their back, right? You're not there to take that it, now, that can go the other way, right? And, and, and maybe being a uh, I've actually had the conversation with a couple of customers like, listen, you know, um, this is a one-sided relationship. And, and if that's what you want, that's fine. But that's not a partnership. That's me being your vendor. And, yeah. and if that's Perfect. what you want, here's what happens, right? So you got to make the call. And oddly enough, they were like, yeah, you're right. And we turned it around. Um, and, and it became, you know, very, a very you know, positive thing. But yeah, that that sincerity can't be faked. And that's the part that I used to hate when I was a, a customer. You could tell the salesperson that was, that was used carring you from a mile away. And, and the ones that cared about you, the ones that cared about your personal success, about your business success, and then they worried about whether or not they were gonna sell you something. So it was way down on the, on the totem pole in the, in the order of importance. Those are the ones I did the most business with and, and yeah, maybe they didn't get it on every order, but over time, I'm sure they were extremely happy with the relationship. Cool. Great conversation, Dan. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Well, you can, you can reach me on LinkedIn, of course. Um, you can also, um, you know, hit me up um, uh, at HCL. If you go out and, and uh, you know, hit up uh, the Big Fix website and you ask for, you know, hey, I want to talk to Dan Corcoran. Everybody will know who I am. They'll get you to me, but mostly on LinkedIn. And um, yeah, Brian, I, I really appreciate the conversation and uh, appreciate your work. And, uh, um, you know, looking, looking forward to, uh, to seeing some more of your work and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk again.